Welcome everyone uh, to Miss Adams Teachers Macbeth, Act 1, Scene 4. So let's get cracking in what is quite a quick scene. So let's just quickly zoom through the summary. So the scene begins with our friend King Duncan um, and his son Malcolm, and they're having a bit of a chinwag about the Thane of Cordor. Now, very important, the original Thane of Cordor, the guy that betrayed them that we found out about in Act 1, Scene 2. Um, and what they're actually talking about is the way that he died. And this is really important because this is about repentance. So he recognised that he had done the wrong thing in betraying Duncan. And so Malcolm says, you know, he was really, really repentant and he died in the best way that a man could die. Um, another little reminder of what Macbeth is about to become. Um, Macbeth, Banquo and the rest of the gang arrive. Duncan is very, very pleased to see them and they have a little moment of being like, oh, we're so lovely. No, you're lovely. No, you're lovely. Um, and promising to what well, Duncan promises to help uh, Macbeth and Banquo kind of progress in life. So it's all very jolly, um, jolly and happy and grateful. But Duncan also makes a point of saying that his son, Malcolm, is going to be given the title the Prince of Cumberland. And it's a reminder that he is the next in line to the throne. So that gets Macbeth's a brain ticking because he's thinking to himself, hang on a minute, if I'm going to become king, I've got to get through Duncan, Malcolm and little bro Donald Bain before it's him. So it, it's another little moment of plotting. Um, and then they all agree that they are going to go and stay at Macbeth's castle. Um, and um, in that moment, Macbeth gets like super intensely into his own thoughts. Um, and Banquo and Duncan just have a lovely little chinwag about how lovely and great Macbeth is. So it's a brilliant bit of dramatic irony in action, because as they are chatting about how great Macbeth is, we are literally listening into Macbeth's dark and twisted kind of thinking. Uh, through the dramatic device that is the aside. So in the rest of the video, I've got about four different quotes for us to have a little look at and pick apart for language analysis. So I'm going to take you through them slide by slide. So this quotation is taken from early on in the scene where Duncan and Malcolm are talking about the original Thane of Cordor. Duncan says, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Again, like I said, talking about the original Thane of Cordor. Now, this idea here that I'm drawing your attention to, it comes back to that theme of appearance versus reality. You know, right from word go, we were told that fair is foul and foul is fair. You can't trust appearances. And Duncan seems to be acknowledging that. He's saying that there's no way of telling. Uh, he uses this metaphor, the mind's construction, recognizing that there's a sense of artificiality that the mind chooses to build something um, that is then presented on the face. Um, he then goes on to say, you know, he was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. And I, I think the adjective here is really important. The adjective absolute. At no point did he waver in his trust of him. Now, if we are thinking about Duncan really positively, we can say, well, it's because he's such a loyal person himself that he wouldn't even dream that anyone else would be disloyal. We could also think perhaps it's a little bit naive, it's a little bit gullible, perhaps he's a little too trusting. And if we have that hat on, then it might be giving us some warning signals about what's to come. And that is exactly where I'm asking you to go here with how does this relate to Macbeth? Well, the Thane of Cordor betrayed Duncan, Macbeth is now the new Thane of Cordor, um, so we are preparing ourselves for his eventual uh, betrayal of Duncan also. So cracking moment for foreshadowing. Let's have a look at the next. Another little moment with Duncan. This is Duncan to Macbeth. He says, I've begun to plant thee and will labour to make thee full of growing. Now, um, I'm drawing attention to the tense here. I have present tense, but then begun. So there's this suggestion that there is more to come um, from from Duncan, that Duncan is going to continue to help. It's only just the beginning um, in his help for Macbeth. And that's quite frustrating for us because we're like, maybe actually, Macbeth, if you just sat tight, your life would be pretty good with Duncan looking after you, uh, because as we know, he's actually a very good king. Um, We've also got this verb here used, and will labour 
to make thee full of growing. So he's willing to work hard for Macbeth. So there's a kind of selflessness to Duncan here. He really does want to do the best for his subjects, Macbeth included. Now, of course, this is a metaphor in itself. Um, I've begun to plant thee, will labour to make thee full of growing again. It's another image of the plant, just like with Banquo when he said, if you can look into the seeds of time. So there's this idea about nature and plant imagery and the idea of potential and growing. And Duncan is saying to Macbeth here, stick with me and I will treat you right. Um, what a shame that he wasn't able to. Um, the question has to be, well, why is Shakespeare doing this? He wants us not just to have feelings about about Duncan. He wants us to be thinking about Macbeth as well. And in light of the fact that Duncan is such a good king here, it perhaps makes us feel more negative, um, more kind of angry with Macbeth for even considering harming the king. OK, this is where it actually gets a little bit sinister. So after Duncan has announced that Malcolm will become the Prince of Cumberland, um, Macbeth in an aside, so this is not in the, you know, the hearing of the other characters. This is just for us. He says, the Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down or else overleap to in my way it lies. So first off, the fact that we begin with an exclamative here, the Prince of Cumberland. I, I don't think we can think to ourselves that it is um, like shock or disbelief because, of course, Malcolm's the heir to the throne. I think it's frustration. I think it's irritation. It's like, oh, he's in my way. Now, we also have something very interesting going on in the pronoun choice. So we've got the use of this uh, pronoun that. It's a pronoun in this case because it's replacing the Prince of Cumberland. It's it's, they, it's, like it's pointing that, like pointing at the Prince of Cumberland in his own mind. That is a step on which I must fall down or else overleap. So it's really, really dehumanising um, using the word that instead of the Prince of Cumberland. And then he continues this dehumanising language by using the metaphor of referring to Malcolm as nothing other than a step that either he'll fall down on or he'll skip over. So he's like, this is either going to stop me in my tracks or it's going to propel me forward. Um, and again, this ends with another dehumanising pronoun for in my way it lies. It's like he's trying to distance himself from the reality of what he has to do, because essentially he's talking about getting rid of Malcolm, another form of treason. So by referring to him as that and it and a step and dehumanising him, it, it removes perhaps part of the part of the guilt. Um, and I think, you know, this is fairly obvious, like when he's talking about overleaping, which is quite a positive verb, really we're being quite euphemistic because he's obviously either thinking about murdering him or removing him in some way. So he's already gone to a very dark place. And then possibly my favourite um, quote from this scene, because it's so relevant to so many other bits. Uh, he says, stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. OK, so first off, what we've got here is we have got imperative language. He's addressing the stars directly and he's giving them orders. Again, kind of demonstrating this sort of hubris or extreme overconfidence. He feels that he can command the stars themselves. It's also personification uh, by asking the stars to hide their fires that's a very human quality obviously so he's personifying the stars in this moment demanding that they 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 put away the light that they normally provide and, and we might well need to think why and if you look at the juxtaposition he says stars hide your fires let not light see my black and deep desires so we've got this juxtaposition of light and dark good versus evil, perhaps. Um, so he wants the stars to hide away the light so that no one can see the dark and sinister deeds that he's going to do. And note the way that that plosive alliteration, deep desires, again, creates a kind of harshness, 
but a sense of volume as well and you've also got that plosive sound although it's not alliteration in black um, there as well so this is obviously incredibly important this moment because it's another example of that appearance and reality it's the idea of light and dark Macbeth is basically saying hide from the world how I'm really feeling you know don't let anyone see how dark my thoughts and potential deeds have become and will become so um this is a cracking quote i would flashcard this one uh, to commit to memory for certain and final thought for the day why is the scene important it's important because it introduces so thoroughly the theme of ambition which is of course macbeth's Hamasha or tragic flaw. It's the thing that's going to bring about his downfall. And we truly see it in action here. In order to fulfill this idea that he could become king, he is already considering murdering or removing the rightful heirs from the throne. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that was useful. If you've got any questions or if there's any material that you would like me to cover, please just drop me a note in the comments and I will happily respond. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already so that you can access all of the videos as they come um, on a range of subjects across English literature and language. Just for now, happy revising.